Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 6520 in the name of Graeme Simpson on essential road improvements. I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Graeme Simpson to speak to and move the motion. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr Simpson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. We have been here before. Nearly a year ago, we held an almost identical debate, calling on the Scottish Government to reaffirm its commitment to duelling the A9 and the A96 and to commit to upgrading other roads. We lost. The SNP amended our motion to take out any reference to any particular roads. Today, they have mentioned both roads, but nowhere in their amendment is there a commitment to fully duel them. Instead, we have the language of short-term fixes and a review. It looks very much as though those historic commitments lie in the gutter. Since our debate last year, a number of lives have been lost on those roads. The SNP was once behind these projects. They committed to fully duelling the A9 between Perth and Inverness by 2025. Since that pledge was made 11 years ago, just over 12 miles have been complete, little over a mile a year. At that rate, it will be 2086 by the time the other 70 miles is finished. And I'm afraid to say that none of us will be around to see that. Nicola Sturgeon can cancel the photo call. There will be no selfies on the A9 for her. <coughs> And nor, nor should there be, because there is a very sorry tale to tell. So far this year, there have been 12 deaths on the A9 between Perth and Inverness. That's the highest number for 12 years, and all on single carriageway sections. The latest, last month, saw 64-year-old George Norris, who was driving a Ford C-Max killed when it was in collision with two other vehicles near Kingussie. Also in October, a man and a woman died when their car collided with a lorry near Burnham, south of Dunkeld. Uh, there were two fatal crashes on the A9 in September, one near Slocht and the other, another near Dunkeld, along with a fatality near Carbridge on September the 30th. And this followed three American family members dying after a collision with a lorry on the A9 near Newton Moor on August the 10th. In July, 68-year-old David McPherson died in a crash at Slock Summit near Carl Bridge with his wife Elsa, 64, and their two-year-old grandson dying in hospital a short time later. 333 people have now been killed on the A9 between Perth and Inverness since 1979. This is why we desperately need to fully duel that road. Accidents will continue to happen if we do, and there are different reasons for all of them, but there will be far fewer of them. We can literally save lives by investing in these roads. Now, what about the A96? Thankfully, the death toll on the A96 this year has not been as bad as on the A9. There's been one fatality, though. That was in January, when 78-year-old John Channon of Dice died following a crash near Old Ern. The campaign to duel the A96 has been going on for 30 years. As far back as 1989, the Press and Journal was running a campaign called End the Carnage, Spend the Cash. And at that point, it was the UK government that was responsible. They didn't end the carnage and they didn't spend the cash. And nor since devolution has anything really changed. In 2011, the SNP committed to completing dueling the road between Inverness and Aberdeen by 2030. Of course, that was before they did their deal with the Greens, which put a halt to things while we wait for a, quote, transparent, evidence-based review of the environmental impacts of the project. Last year, Transport Scotland was claiming that study would be completed by the end of this year. The Minister's amendment 
makes the same claim today. Well, I can only hope that Transport Scotland hasn't been listening too much to the words of Green MSP Maggie Chapman last year when she predicted the review would find that it, it is, quote, actually isn't viable to duel the whole way. The problem we have here is that the SNP have been ensnared by the Greens. It's almost as though Jenny Gilruth has to ask permission from Maggie Chapman to do anything. I mean, you can imagine the conversation, you know. Please, Maggie, can I duel the roads? No, Minister, no, don't you remember? It's not viable. We really are in a bad place if we're to base our roads improvement programme on the views of Maggie Chapman. Of course, investing in these roads is not just about road safety. Making transport easier boosts local and because of their strategic importance, the national economy. We wouldn't expect the anti-growth Greens to understand this, but I would have thought the wiser heads in the SNP might. Deputy Presiding Officer, it would be remiss of me not to mention other roads in dire need of improvement in Scotland, such as the A75 and the A77. Between them, there have been nine fatal accidents between 2018 and last year, a shocking toll of death. Today, I met members of the A77 Action Group. Uh, uh, the members yes. bringing his remarks to close. Uh, I'm happy to take well, the Well, we'll have to conclude by, uh, with your seven minutes. I'm happy uh, to take Finley it. Carson, briefly, please. Join me in welcoming the news after concerted efforts from these benches, the Scottish Government have dropped their grievance-led hardline no cooperation approach on the union connectivity and now is engaging positively on how our two governments can come together to bring much needed uh, investment Simpson, to the A75. Have, uh, 20 seconds left. Thank you. Thank you. I thoroughly agree with uh, Mr Carson. He is a champion of these roads. I don't want to be here moving this motion. It shouldn't be necessary. So, but with regret, I do move the motion in my name. Thank you, Mr Simpson. I now call on Jenny Ruth, Minister, to speak to and move Amendment 6520.2. Up to six minutes, please, Minister. Presiding officer, uh, I thank the Conservatives for bringing uh, forward today's motion for debate. The tone of the motion is respectful to the families of those who have lost loved ones on Scotland's roads, and I will, of course, continue that sentiment throughout my contribution today. Presiding officer, the publication of reported road casualties in Scotland for 2021 showed a broadly stable picture of deaths and injuries on our roads, one less fatality than in 2020 and a single percentage increase in injuries. But that will not be the picture for 2022. We already know that the statistics for this year are going to be very different. To date in 2022, 10 fatal injury accidents have been recorded on the A9 trunk road with 15 fatal casualties. Of the 10 fatal accidents, seven have occurred between Perth and Inverness, resulting in 12 casualties. Uh, fatal casualties, rather. To compare this with previous years, therefore, there was only one fatal accident between Perth and Inverness in each of 2019, 2020 and 21. Presiding officer, every death on the A9 and on any of Scotland's roads is one too many. Every life lost has devastating impacts for families, friends, colleagues and communities. And I want to express my sympathies today to everyone or anyone who has been affected by such a loss and to anyone who has been injured on our roads. We know the very human costs of loss and the toll that also takes on our emergency services. Now, I'm sure that members will understand, as police investigations are ongoing into recent accidents, it would not be appropriate for me, nor indeed any of us, to comment significantly on any individual uh, case today. However, I do want to assure members that I have met with Police Scotland in recent weeks uh, in Inverness and uh, last week um, to better understand the increase in fatal accidents and the underlying contributing factors. On Friday of this week, I will chair the A9 Safety Group in Pitlochry, along with wider partners from our roads operating company, Police Scotland, the Road Haulage and Freight uh, Transport Associations, local councils and the CPT. Thereafter, I will meet with constituency and regional members to hear their views and concerns and to ensure that those are taken into account in planning the required short-term interventions. And in the coming weeks, I will announce additional short-term measures for the A9 between Perth and Inverness in advance of dueling works. It is worth saying that this year alone, the Scottish Government has invested over £7 million in spend on maintenance structures and on road safety improvements on the A9 this year. Yes, I will. Graeme Simpson. 
I thank the Minister for taking the intervention. Um, and of course, short-term measures can have an effect. But would she uh, accept that fully dueling both these roads could lead to a significant improvement in road safety? Minister. I think Mr Simpson makes a fair assertion. I'll come to that in uh, my preceding remarks, if he, if he doesn't mind. Um, I want to reflect, though, that we have made that investment and we will further be making investments this year to improve safety at Balnuig, at Brewer and also in Rallia. But I accept, presiding officer, that, that more will need to be done before full dueling is complete. Now, turning to full dueling, this government remains absolutely committed to investment in the A9, including dueling the A9 between Perth and Inverness. We have already, as I mentioned, invested uh, significant finance in this, approximately £431 million to date, delivering the duelling programme. That has allowed road users to benefit from the dueled stretches between King Craig and Dalradi and Lancarte and Pass of Burnham, which opened in 2017 and in August 21, respectively. It has also supported the development progress through the statutory processes, advanced work and procurement evaluation work being undertaken for the remainder of the programme. We are currently in procurement for the award of construction contract for the section between Tamat and Tamoy. Final decisions on that will be subject to our normal tender evaluation and that business case approval. But we are also progressing design work on the rest of the programme, with the statutory process well underway for seven of the eight remaining sections. On the Pass of Burnham to Tay Crossing project, that has not started the statutory process yet, but Transport Scotland is currently progressing the design and assessment work to identify the preferred route option for that section, following the co-creative process with the local community. Further, work is ongoing to determine the most suitable procurement options for these remaining sections of the road. That needs to consider a wider range of factors, of course, including how the project can be delivered most efficiently by the industry, whilst minimising disruption to road users. And I very much hope that the wider MSP forum that I have contacted, my private office has contacted members about today, will seek to set out some of the, the detail in relation to those sections to members. Now, turning to the A96, as Mr Simpson notes, um, there has not been a similar increase in accidents on the A96. He pointed to one fatality this year. And I think it probably is worth saying these are very different roads. But it is this government's uh, commitment, and it remains so, to fully duel the A96 between Inverness and Aberdeen. But as... Yes, Mr Ross. Uh, Douglas Ross. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way, and I'm grateful to hear that commitment to fully duel the A96, and I hope to see that coming to fruition. But she was written to in September by Murray Chamber of Commerce, outlining how important the duelling is for businesses in Murray. So far, there's been no response to the Chamber. So will she get back in touch with Murray Chamber of Commerce, who need reassurance from the Scottish Government that this infrastructure link will be delivered? Minister. Uh, happy to do so. I apologise to, to Mr Ross and to the Chamber. I will ensure that they receive a, a response from my private office. Um, now, as members know, and I think as has been alluded to already, we are conducting a transparent evidence-based review of the corridor. The recent public consultation uh, received uh, over nearly 5,000 responses, generating over 11,000 suggestions and potential opportunities for the route. And rightly, it has taken more time than I think was originally planned to look at and appraise all of those options accordingly. But it, the, the public consultation and the initial appraisal will be published by the end of the year, as the amendment makes very clear and as Mr Simpson also alludes to. We are also continuing the preparation for the duelling uh, to the Inverness to Nairn section. That is quite a different section of the route. Members might recall that that uh, has already received ministerial consent following a public local inquiry. And I expect to be able to make the orders on this part of the A96 in the coming weeks. Now, earlier this year, presiding officer, I was really pleased to meet with the constituency MSP and MP in Nairn and to meet with local school children at Rosebank Primary School. The playground of that primary school borders the A96. The pupils explained to me what that meant for their learning, for their outdoor play and for their environment. So it's really imperative that we deliver on these road improvements for local communities, but particularly, in my view, for the generations yet to come. Minister, I must ask you to bring your mind. I appreciate you took two interventions, which I'm sure members wanted to hear your response to, uh, but I must ask you to wind up now, please. Presiding officer, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I now call on Neil Bibby to speak to and move amendment 6520.1. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr Bibby. Thank you, presiding officer, and I move the amendment in my name. I thank Graeme Simpson for bringing forward this debate this afternoon. I would normally say I welcome one of his debates, but as Mr Simpson acknowledged, of course, we would rather not be discussing the serious topic of road safety in such tragic circumstances. Over the last decade, almost 200 people have sadly lost their lives on Highland roads. In the last six years, more than half the deaths in the area took place on the A9, A96 and A82. 
And in just the last three months, there have been a further eight deaths on the 25-mile stretch of the A9 alone. One of those killed was just two years old. As the death toll on the A9 climbs, it is now at its highest it has been in 20 years. And as the Minister said, every report of a fatality is a person and a family left behind. We can only imagine the pain felt by the family members and friends of those who have lost loved ones on these roads. We must do all we can to make roads such as the A9 and A96 safer. safer. And I welcome what the uh, Minister has said about short-term measures. Um, I am concerned, and as I am sure other members will be, to hear reports that not only are police officers being cut across Scotland, but also the number of traffic police officers are being reduced too. This is one issue that I think needs to be addressed and looked at in the context of the areas that we are talking about today. But also, uh, and for the long term, crucially, the Government must invest to upgrade these roads. The SNP has given clear manifesto commitments to dual A9 by 2025 and the A96 between Inverness and Aberdeen by 2030. The Deputy First Minister and Finance Secretary John Swinney said in 2019, in answer to Mr Harvey, that he recognised the very serious and alarming safety records on these roads, and the situation appears to be getting worse, not better. Local people will therefore expect the SNP to deliver on their promises. We need to see urgent and major investment in our transport infrastructure across Scotland, whether that be in rail, roads, ferry and active travel. And the criteria for investment needs to take fully into account safety issues, journey times, economic and community development, as well as the impact on the climate. Yes, sir. Brian, was it? Very grateful for Neil Bibby for giving way. He was in the meeting today with me uh, in the A75, A77 uh, um, Action Group. I wonder what his response is to their assertion that during a meeting with the Cabinet Secretary, she said she had to ask permission from the Greens to do any road infrastructure projects. Neil Bibby? I will just, I'll just come on to that, uh, Mr Little. Thank you for any intervention. Um, investment to upgrade transport infrastructure clearly is not just an issue for the north and north-east of Scotland, but also for the south-west of Scotland too. And earlier today, along with Mr Bittwell, I did meet uh, AAC7 Action Group, who are campaigning to have the A77 and A75 upgraded and brought up to dual carriage standard. We, there are safety issues there too, as well as strong economic grounds for investment due to being our main link to Northern Ireland. Uh, and I do know they, they met the Minister earlier, but I also understand, as Mr Whittle has just said there, uh, they were concerned at the Minister telling them that the SNP's partnership with the Greens may hinder their efforts to have this progressed. Um, I, certainly, uh, I, certainly would, I certainly will take an intervention and would be grateful if the Minister would clarify, do the Greens have a veto on SNP roads policy, yes or no? Minister. Presenting officer, I do not appreciate two separate members taking words uh, that were given in a private meeting with a group in relation to a road earlier today. Well, neither of you were in the room. Uh, I had a very positive meeting with the action group today. I made time to meet with them and to listen to their concerns. So I would be grateful if the member could clarify his understanding of that conversation. I had a wide-ranging conversation with that group, including, for example, as I think we've heard Mr Carson allude to, in relation to the UK government. A wide range of matters were discussed, but I don't think it's appropriate, presiding officer, to have my words in a meeting which neither member were present in repeated in the chamber today. So perhaps he would like to correct the record to that effect. Neil Bibby. Um, I, I noticed the, the Minister didn't answer the question whether the Greens have a veto on SNP policy or not, because he's not actually um, denying the claim that was made. Um, I, I, as I said earlier, I understand they were concerned that the Minister telling them the Greens partnership with the SNP may hinder their efforts to have this progressed. And I was not you know, not aware that um, these meetings were secret meetings, um, presiding officer. Um, I listed earlier the factors that should be considered in determining priorities for infrastructure investment. One factor that really shouldn't be present for the SNP when taking these decisions is whether the Scottish Greens like it or not. People deserve clarity on the Scottish Government's position on roads investment. We do need to know from the SNP whether the Greens have a veto on their roads policy or not. And people deserve clarity from the Greens on their position when it comes to votes on roads investment. Because the last time we debated roads in this Parliament, almost a year ago, the Scottish Greens attacked my party because we do believe money needs to be spent on upgrading key routes. Now, the Scottish Government amendment today spells out in black and white that over £400 million has been spent on drilling the A9 to date. That is over £400 million allocated in budgets that the Scottish Greens have voted for. 
So it begs the question, if the Greens are against spending money on roads, why do they keep backing budgets that spend money on roads? Scottish Labour, of course, acknowledges the challenges we face when it comes to the climate emergency, and we need to do more to encourage less car travel and to help people onto public transport, and that is subject of our amendment. That is an issue I hope we could all agree on, but we have regrettably seen a decline on our public transport system under this government. I have said it before and I will say it again, public transport in Scotland is frankly a joke. There needs, does not seem to be much ambition on show from the government to address it either. On rail, we have seen rail fares hiked and 250 services cut a day compared to the pre-pandemic timetable. On buses and the used roads too, of course, local councils are still waiting for additional powers and funding from the Scottish Government so they can bring buses back under public control. Meanwhile, private bus companies continue to fail passengers with skyrocketing fares and cuts of socially necessary routes. Cities like Manchester and Liverpool are bringing buses back under public control and capping fares at £2. We need to see that action in Scotland, uh, in Scottish cities such as Glasgow, Perth, Inverness and Aberdeen, because we won't get people out of their cars onto public transport until we have a public transport system that is affordable, accessible and reliable. And there is no better example of how disconnected our communities are than in one of those areas we are talking about today. The BBC journalist Douglas Fraser documented his recent trip by bus from Inverness to Aberdeen, where he had to change buses at Broxton Interchange Station uh, outside of Perth, which takes five hours. I understand there is a direct stagecoach service between Inverness and Aberdeen, but that is not much better, taking a staggering four hours and 15 minutes to travel along the A96 from Inverness to Perth, a 104-mile journey, which means people travelling at an average speed of just 24 miles per hour between those two cities. If we want to reduce traffic on the A96, then we also need to consider how we improve bus links and public transport links between those two cities. Design officer, we need major and urgent transport infrastructure investment in the areas we have discussed today and across other parts of Scotland, including roads, so that we can support building local, economy, local economies, better connect our communities and provide the action necessary in addressing issues around safety, something that has been demanded by people for many years. Thank you, Mr Bibby. I now call Liam MacArthur. Up to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you. And can I thank uh, Graham Simpson, uh, likewise, for allowing Parliament to have this debate and, and, and actually the tone of it uh, as well, which I think has been entirely in keeping with the seriousness of the, the issue. Can I also thank um, Neil Bibby for lodging uh, Labour's amendment, which uh, may give me an opportunity, if time uh, permits, to reference ferries uh, without incurring the wrath of the Chair for being uh, off, uh, off piste. Um, can I also declare an interest, unlike uh, perhaps Edward Mountain and one or two other colleagues, I, I am a, a regular user of the A9, though not as regular, uh, I appreciate, as some. I, I would also observe that some of the issues in relation to connectivity and indeed safety apply as much beyond uh, Inverness and further north um, as they do in relation to the Perth to Inverness um, state. Uh, I think, though, um, I will focus most of my remarks on, on the A9, as I'm more familiar with those um, conditions and circumstances than I am with the A96. I think the, the case for improvement for duelling has long been accepted um, and indeed long been promised. I, I think what we're talking about here is the pace at which that, um, that commitment is delivered. Some of the argument has long been economic about the better connectivity we need to see not least between our main cities, some of our main cities, Perth, Inverness uh, and Aberdeen, but uh, many of the outlying towns uh, and villages uh, beyond that. I think, as Neil Bibby quite rightly drew attention to in his comments there, some of the travel times, not just by road but by rail as well, and, and uh, are by European standards, even by the standards of other parts of the UK, absolutely ridiculous. And certainly, if we're trying to encourage people out of their cars and onto public transport, uh, unlikely to, to serve uh, that purpose. Uh, but rightly, the, debate, the focus of the debate today is in relation to the, the safety case uh, for the, uh, the, the, the duelling. I looked at the statistics uh, between 2012 and 2019. There appeared to be a doubling in terms of deaths and serious injuries. I appreciate there has been a slight change in the way in which serious injuries are, are, are captured in the statistics, but, but those are are fairly frightening figures. And when you then layer upon that what we've seen over the, the past 12 months, the, the case just be, um, seems to be, to be absolutely unanswerable. There are undoubtedly individual factors in terms of each of those cases. As a regular user of the A9, it often occurs to me that you have a mixture 
of people who are regular users and very confident on the roads, um, and those, particularly tourists, who are unfamiliar, underconfident. Uh, and that seems to be a recipe for, um, for, for problems to exist. We have also seen some of this arising for the improvements that we have seen in recent years. Um, a situation where you are moving from single to dual carriageway and, uh, and, and overtaking stretches that can, particularly for those who are not familiar with uh, the road, be very confusing indeed, alongside some junctions uh, that, again, even for, for uh, regular users of, of the road, uh, can be somewhat confusing uh, and therefore uh, precarious. Um, so, as I say, the case on a safety basis is absolutely compelling. There are other things that need to be done. We do need to see that modal shift, particularly in terms of getting more of the freight uh, off the road. And again, I would make that argument for north of Inverness as well as from uh, between Perth uh, and Inverness. Um, and I think in terms of the public transport, we need to look beyond simply the main routes. Um, certainly, bus routes that link into those uh, main routes are absolutely vital in terms of encouraging more people to take up those uh, services. And that talks to the wider uh, strategic review of transport. And this is where I will segue using Neil Bibby's uh, amendment uh, into the, the, uh, the issue of the SP, uh, STPR. I think the exclusion of Orkney's lifeline air and ferry services from that, um, uh, that, that, that review are, is absolutely inexcusable and needs to be addressed. And I, I hope I have had useful meetings with the Minister. I would hope she would be able to confirm that is, in, that is the case. But again, I thank uh, Graham Simpson for allowing Parliament to have this debate, I think to show the cross-party support there is for pressing ahead um, as quickly as we possibly can with the duelling of these vital arteries. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr MacArthur. And we now move to the open debate speeches. I call Murdo Fraser to be followed by Paul McLennan. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Fraser. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I just say at the outset, I, I would uh, associate myself with all the comments made by Lee MacArthur and what I thought was a very well-informed contribution on these issues. The A9 trunk road between Perth and Inverness has an unenviable reputation as Scotland's most dangerous road. Over the years, we have seen too many serious accidents and fatalities, mostly on the single carriageway sections of the route. This year has been one of the worst on record, as we have heard. In just 10 months, we have had 12 fatalities on single carriageways. Each one of these is a tragedy with enormous knock-on consequences for the families and friends of those who are involved. This is a vital issue for my constituents in Perthshire who have to use the road daily, and I know and they know how deadly it is. It is also a matter that uh, affects me personally. In 1990, the car I was in was involved in a head-on collision uh, on the A9 single carriageway near Car Bridge. I suffered multiple fractures and spent weeks in hospital. I was one of the lucky ones. I survived. Others have not been so fortunate. For decades now, I have been campaigning for A9 improvements with petitions at public meetings and by raising the issue in Parliament with successive ministers. It has been clear to me, as to many others, that only by completing the duelling of the road would we substantially reduce the accident risk. I was pleased, therefore, that in 2011 we saw the first real commitment from the SNP government to duel the road in its entirety as far as Inverness in its infrastructure investment plan. Sadly, since then, progress has been slow. The A9 duelling programme was due to start in 2015 and be completed by 2025. However, in the 11 years since that commitment was made, just 12 and a half miles of dual carriageway have been opened. That's 12 and a half miles in 15 years of SNP government. To put that in perspective, the Conservative governments of Margaret Thatcher and John Major opened 25.3 miles of dual carriageway between Perth and Inverness, more than twice as much. Now, I know that COVID has caused delays to all uh, infrastructure projects, but even with that, progress has been painfully slow. Would the, would the member give way on that? Yes, Ed Edward yeah. Mountain, briefly, please. Um, I thank the member for giving way on that. On the A9 between Perth and Inverness, there are only two areas where compulsory purchase of land for duelling would be difficult, Dunkeld and Aviemore. So surely this government, if it wants to meet its target, should get on with duelling the rest of it and compuls start compulsory purchasing the land now. Otherwise, it's going to remain a pipe dream. Mr Fraser, you have about a minute left. Thank you. Yes, I think my colleague, Mr Mountain, makes a very good point, because I know that there are communities along the A9 wondering 
if the project will ever now be completed. And the involvement of the anti-road Greens in government has added to their concern. And it is noteworthy that the government amendment to today's debate does not restate a commitment to A9 duelling, as Graham Simpson pointed out. That is unfortunate, and we need to be clear that it will proceed, and we need to know when. I am regularly contacted by constituents who live on or close to the A9, wanting clarity on the route. And this is particularly the case in communities like Dunkeld and Burnham, where the A9 passes very close to people's homes and businesses. Without a clear plan and timetable, these properties are effectively blighted. What we need is clarity and soon. Presiding officer, there are strong economic arguments for the benefits to Perthshire and to the Highlands and Islands from completing A9 duelling, but to me this is principally an issue of road safety. Too many people have died on the A9 single carriageways. They are dying this year. They will continue to die. That is why we need action now, and that is why we should support Mr Simpson's motion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fraser. I now call Paul McLennan to be followed by Douglas Lumsden. Up to four minutes, please, Mr. McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. The, the recent accidents on A9 are, of course, a tragedy for everyone involved. My sympathies are with the families and friends of everyone affected by, by these events. Duel of the A96 is, of course, a manifesto commitment uh, in successive SNP manifestos. And now, you might ask why am I speaking in this debate. My own constituency, East Lothian, has the main East Coast Road A1 pass through it. This was duelled around about 2000. Prior to that, this was a two-lane road with no passing points. I remember the frustration of residents, commuters and, and business at the time, and also lost friends eh, on that road. Three friends when they were 17-year-old, three guys in the same car. So I remember that very, eh, very vaguely. Um, the duel of the A96 has huge public support for the following reasons. It links two major cities, of course, Aberdeen and Inverness. I'm not conscious of the time. I've only got four minutes. Um, sorry. It, like next two major cities, Aberdeen and Manesset, currently is a road that, that pinpoints in large uh, towns in between. The road is used as, by many slow-moving vehicles like agriculture and HGV vehicles, which can cause driver frustration and has a lack of safe overtaking opportunities, again like the A1 previously. Of course, the A96 is a commuter route for Inverness and Aberdeen for many towns and villages along the corridor. There is an equity and fairness issue in terms of infrastructure for rural areas. There are, of course, fast, safe dual roads between other Scottish cities, but not between Inverness and Aberdeen. This disadvantages residents in all the towns and villages along that corridor. Of course, the review in line with climate change commitments of course, is necessary, but that of course, should be balanced with addressing long-term safety and equity concerns of users on this corridor. Uh, a modern highway that facilitates the fast charging of low-emissions vehicles as well has, uh, has, and has also has safe, segregated, active travel solutions should also be the goal. Slow-moving traffic is bad for emissions. You can see that from the AWPR, how a safe dual route, which facilitates high-gear driving and overtaking of the vehicles, can reduce emissions long-term. The people who use this corridor are not just people who live in the towns right next to the corridor. They, of course, come from more rural towns where people have limited public transport options, again, very similar to, to East Lothian. There is a great deal of support uh, in Aberdeenshire and throughout the north-east of, uh, of Scotland for duelling of the A96 in the region to improve safety, reliability and efficiency, of course, for road users. A lot of them are road users because they have no reliable, quick, affordable uh, alternatives. And again, that's been mentioned and again, quite similar to Eastfield in, in many ways. Road safety, of course, is paramount importance to the Scottish Government and to the Parliament overall. The road safety framework that the Minister touched on earlier on was backed last year by £20 million, uh, £21 million. Pounds. That was an uplift of £17 million. Pounds. The Scottish Government, of course, is absolutely committed to completing the dual A9, and we've heard that from the Minister today and welcome that, and could do so much faster if it had more capital funding and if it was not being cut at every budget. We've heard of the budget pressures just from John Swinney just earlier this afternoon. I've only got four minutes. Um, we all recognise that improved road safety also brings economic benefits to road users and local communities of Scotland. Roads cannot be duelled overnight. And let's remember that the Scottish Government has already invested more than £400 million in duelling the A9. And that's part of a £3 billion investment to duel the A9, and it's one of the biggest transport infrastructure projects in Scotland's history. The current uh, Scottish Government remains committed to the north and north east of, of Scotland, including uh, during the, uh, the A96 and the A9 of Ferd. Corridor taking forward an enhanced programme that improves connectivity between surrounding towns, tackles congestions and addresses safety and environmental issues. The current plan, of course, is to fully dual the A96 route between Inverness and Aberdeen. However, the Scottish Government quite rightly is conducting a transparent, evidence-based review of the programme, which is underway in the report by the end of the year. In conclusion, President Officer, the Scottish Government is committed 
to improving the road, ne uh, road network on the A9 and A96. And I'm glad we've had that commitment again endorsed by, by the Minister this afternoon. I share frustrations with local members, having been through similar uh, experiences with A1. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McLennan. I now call Douglas Lumsden to be followed by Fergus Ewing. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Lumsden. Thank you, President Officer, and thanks to my colleagues for bringing this important debate that is uh, of key importance to my area of the North East. It has been 11 years since this symbolic SNP government first announced the A96 would be upgraded from a single to a dual carriageway. 11 years of broken promises, dither and delay from this government. But make no mistake, this delay has cost lives. Between 2018 and 2021, the A96 has seen 11 fatal accidents and 94 non-fatal accidents. And I send my condolences to all those families who have been affected by these tragic events. Between January and August this year, nine people have been seriously injured on the Huntley to Inverness stretch alone of this notorious road. The grubby deal between the SNP and their anti-growth, anti-business, anti-car, anti-North East Green partners has now just, not just delayed the project, but firmly put the brakes on it. Presiding officer, and it's not just lives that depend on the duelling of the A96, but jobs also. In June, Liz Cameron, Chief Executive of the Scottish Chamber of Commerce, said that the region needed a firm commitment on the duelling to give the region a much needed boost. She added the Chamber are firmly of the view that the Scottish Government should honour the commitment made to businesses and communities along the A96 that the, duel, the road is duelled from start to finish unlocking economic growth, workforce mobility and investment along the route and provided improved connections between two of Scotland's leading cities and areas of economic growth. And in an article in the PNJ last December, Hollier Colin Lawson said that duelling had to happen urgently, adding that people in all the towns and surrounding villages within the A96 corridor have suffered enough. It has become one of the worst trunk roads in the UK. Would the member give way? Yes, I will. Craig Hoy. Mr Lumpton, uh, for giving way. Does he agree with me that investment is needed right across uh, Scotland's uh, road network, and particularly uh, in the south of Scotland, in Sheriff Hall, uh, where congestion is building up every single day, largely as a result of, uh, of the, uh, the Greens organising a write-in to force it to public inquiry? So will he agree with me that this action is urgently needed also in the A1 in relation to Belhaven Junction? Dr. I, I, I agree with the member. There is uh, investment needed right across our road network, because that is another um, the, the, the toll of Burness in just north of Ellen in my constituency is another area that the uh, Scottish Government needs to um, focus on. Presiding officer, the duelling of the A96 should be a priority for this Government and should have been delivered long ago. I stand up and speak in this chamber every week about broken promises from this SNP Green devolved Government of Chaos, and this is just one more to add to that long list. Businesses, residents, the NHS, hauliers, the oil industry, traders have all called on this government to move forward with the duelling. They are crying out for increased investment in their road network. Public transport is not always a solution for those living in rural areas, and these trunk roads are a vital lifeline for our rural, rural communities in the North East. It is wrong for them to be ignored for 11 years by this government and for their priorities to be ignored and sidelined. Presiding officer, it is clear that when it comes to business rates, the oil and gas industry and now roads, the SNP have turned their backs on the North East, and it is shameful. Warm words are not needed, Minister, nor empty promises, but action. So will you commit today to duelling the A96 and give the communities, residents, employers and business owners the reassurance that they need that they are being listened to by this government? Thank you, President. Thank you, Mr Lumsden. I now call Fergus Ewing to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Ewing. Officer, I am grateful to the Scottish Conservatives for giving us the opportunity to debate these vital matters this afternoon. For many in the Highlands and indeed beyond, many who have lost loved ones in their families, in some cases more than one member of their family, and who have lost Friends, as, as I and others have had, have, have, as we have heard, 222 will be there, Annus Horribilis. It leaves behind the devastation of impacts lifelong on their lives and their families. And that is why I, I welcome the tone set by the Minister that this is the most serious 
of matters. And my theme today is that what do people of Scotland want from us? They want progress. Minister, they want real, rapid, solid, concrete, substantial progress. But I truly believe that they don't really want politics. And by that I mean party politics, a partisan approach, because it is just too serious for that. So uh, I don't think I need to rehearse the arguments, Minister, that single carriageways are more conducive of risk than dual carriageways. The Road Safety Foundation studied years ago that proves that, I think, fairly conclusively. The facts, and most drivers are acutely aware of this, that single carriageways do not have a central reservation. Therefore, head-on collisions have nothing to prevent them. The velocity of head-on collisions at 60 miles an hour for each vehicle, the vehicle stop, go to zero, but the internal organs carry on at 60 miles an hour. And that is why uh, the impact and the consequences of these particular incidents on single carriageways are just so appalling and so serious. And the junctions, Mr MacArthur, I think, made a number of relevant uh, descriptive remarks at the junctions at Aviemore, at, at, at Kinusi, uh, at uh, Carbridge and others are all places associated with very, very serious incidents and deaths. And of course, visitors to this country are unfamiliar with road laws, signs and systems. So I have three asks as the Minister in the short time that I have. They are one, to progress the duelling works as swiftly as possible. Number two, to publish a revised plan of when the duelling commitments will be completed in respect of the A9 from Perth to Inverness and the A96 in my patch, a commitment that is actually enshrined in the Butte House Agreement. And thirdly, as the Minister is already doing this Friday, and I know before and for months, and her predecessor, Mr Day, to work on further safety measures which, ad interim, uh, can be progressed to improve lighting, signage, education and so on. There is more that can be done, I believe, and many of my constituents have contributed to that. I would also ask that the Scottish Government, given the gravity of all these matters and the strength of feeling, consider bringing forward ministerial statements on each of these serious matters in due course. I did particularly want to say that progress has been made, Lunkerty to pass from Burnham Dalradi to Kincraig, but also on the other nine sections. In almost every case, there's been painstaking and detailed and expensive and thorough design work, preparatory work, engineering work, community engagement. Don't overlook all of that. There's an enormous amount of work that's gone into this. To say that nothing has happened is simply wrong. And maybe we need to take our own trumpet out of the case and blow it a little bit more just to say what work that has been. But can I ask, there are four sections, Tay to Bannon Louis, Pitlochry to Killy Cranky, uh, Grengarry to Dalwini and Dalwini to Cruben Moore. They seem to me to be ready, Minister, to go ahead. Can it be answered either today or shortly? When will these go ahead? When will they go to procurement? And can we have those decisions as quickly as possible? I will conclude, presiding officers, I think my, my time is up, and I, of course, don't want to get into your bad books. But uh, in conclusion, I think the theme for me today is that what the people of Scotland want is progress, progress, real progress, not party politics. Thank you, Mr Ewing. I now call Mark Roscoe to be followed by Michelle Thompson. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Roscoe. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm sure that there isn't a single member in this parliament who hasn't been affected directly or indirectly by a tragic road accident over the years. And it was in that spirit that I was looking forward this afternoon to a genuine debate about the actions that the government can take to save lives on the A9 and the A96, from improving dangerous junctions to rolling out average speed cameras. But instead, we have seen an attempt to use recent accidents to bolster the case for duelling every single inch of the A9 and the A96 without any analysis about why recent accident rates have worsened or how they could have been prevented in the first place. Now, it's important that we go back to the basics here. According to Transport Scotland, the case for the A9 duelling project was largely an economic one. It was about reducing journey times between Inverness and Perth. The secondary benefits in reducing driver frustration and reducing the severity, if not the frequency, 
of accidents came later. Now, there have been calls, as members have reflected from communities along the A9 over many years, to improve dangerous junctions and to reduce speed. And these priorities are reflected in the Butte House Agreement, which commits both the SNP and the Greens to addressing and tackling safety concerns on our roads while responding to community needs and delivering our climate ambitions across Scotland. It's about directing investment where it's most needed and where it can actually make a real tangible difference. And I accept that targeted improvements are needed. And I was proud to back the campaign over a decade ago now to improve the dangerous Ballin Lewig junction on the A9. Every time I drive that junction today, I think back to how dangerous it was and I think to how many lives have been saved as a result of that investment. And the community today in Dunkeld and Burnham still live with a high-speed junction that is both confusing and dangerous. And I back their calls for investment in a safer junction, speed reduction, better signage and other measures. And I look forward to the meeting that the Minister will be convening with local members next week on this. But as with the original problem at Ballin Lewig, these are made even more critical because some of the high, speed, high speeds exist on dualed sections of the road already. Let's not forget that the continuously dualed section of the A9 between Perth and Dunblane has also had tragic junction accidents that have required further sustained investment over many years. Simply dueling is not a panacea to address deep-seated accident and road safety issues on our roads. It needs an evidence-led approach. Now, for the A96, there is a chance with the government's review to look afresh at what investments are genuinely needed on that corridor, including public transport, and that is embedded in the Butte House Agreement. I have my doubts that that review will conclude that duelling every single last inch of that road is the best option for safety for communities or for the climate. I don't, I'm running short of time, unless there's time in hand. Um, but we do need to champion measures that have already worked on the A9 and other roads in Scotland to improve road safety. And it is clear that average speed cameras save lives. On the A9, fatalities fell by 40% in the first three years after their introduction. Collisions were down by nearly a quarter, while frustrating road closures due to accidents were reduced again by a quarter. So it's disappointing that there's been no mention so far in this debate, or in the Tory motion, about the role of average speed cameras. So I hope the Minister perhaps can reflect on their potential for the A96 in closing. Presiding officer, the Government is right to mention the worsening financial settlement handed down to this Parliament. It will limit the ability of Government to invest in the right projects that we need to save lives. Projects to improve road safety, bypass communities, or maintain roads will be threatened by the slash and burn austerity of the Tory party. We must have the ability to invest in genuine road safety improvements to protect lives across Scotland. That needs budget and a real focus on the measures that will actually work, backed up by the evidence. Thank you, Mr Ruskell. I now call Michelle Thompson, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to speak in this debate and support my colleague Fergus Ewing's calls for an updated timeline for the comp completion of the duelling to the A9. The people of the Highlands have a great advocate and persistent fighter on their behalf. As has been acknowledged earlier, there are still too many lives lost or damaged on Scotland's roads, and of course not least on the roads in question. I'm sure the Chamber is united in expressing our condolences to all those affected. Now, there are clearly issues of trust and confidence involved where, whenever there are significant project delays, regardless of the reason. So further information always adds value, and I'm therefore very grateful for the earlier comments by the Minister. It is right to acknowledge all the work that's been done thus far, and I don't simply mean the completion of some sections of the A9, but both the design and preparatory work that's been undertaken on all other sections due for duelling. And of course, the work on the Tomatin to Moy section I mentioned previously and mentioned by the Minister that's due to be completed by 2025. Having travelled up the A9 myself on occasions, I'm very aware of having to have a heightened sense of care as the road changes. No one thinks the current stage of development is sufficient, hence the continuing commitment to complete this important work. 
But we have to reflect that there have been huge problems with many large-scale projects in recent years due to the halting of much project work over the period of the pandemic. And I suspect, if we're honest, each and every MSP can point to delayed projects in their own constituency. There's also an added financial problem as the capital cost increases due to inflationary pressures compounded by supply chain problems. Such effects are very real and have to be carefully addressed. Ignoring the context serves no one, not least of those campaigning to see projects completed. And this is an example of why I've been regularly calling for the Scottish Government to have full rather than limited borrowing powers to enable us to borrow to invest. Now, the UK Government have been very willing in recent works to happily borrow eye-watering sums counted in the tens of billions to bail out their own failures whilst denying Scotland appropriate borrowing powers for critical capital investment. Now, I would hope all those wanting for the very... I will absolutely on that point, if you can answer that point. Finlay Carson. It, it's quite incredible uh, you're making these statements because uh, out the Union Connectivity Review, the, the UK Government made a commitment to fund uh, improvements on the A75, which is of huge economic significance. But the Scottish Government refused to sit down with them, despite £20 million on the table, to build up the, the process and how the two governments could work together. Michelle Thompson. You fundamentally fail to understand the point. The point I'm making is about capital borrowing powers for this Parliament where the member sits and should be contributing to our Scottish Parliament and our Scottish people. So I would hope that all those, as I said, wanting for the best of reason to hasten capital spend, such as the duelling, will also equally well argue for increased borrowing powers. And if anyone else wants to intervene at that point to strengthen our capacity, I'm willing to take it. But to conclude, I'd very much like the Minister to address two questions in her summing up. First, is she able to outline the major impediments to publish a timeline for completion of the duelling in both the A9 and the A96? And second, what exactly is the current state of play regarding capital funding for the projects? And let's hope we can all get this project back on the road to completion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Thompson. And we now move to closing speeches. And I call on Colin Smith to wind up on behalf of Scottish Labour up to six minutes, please, Mr Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I think today's debate has shown that the case for the upgrade of the A96 and the A9 is stark. Graham Simpson reminded us of the tragic fact that over 330 people alone have died on the A9 since 1979. As Murdo Fraser said, each of those is a tragedy. I think Fergus Ewan spoke passionately about the fact that some of the deaths on those northern roads can involve several people of the same family. A week rarely goes by when we do not hear of another casualty or, all too often, tragically, another fatality. Presumably, as Neil Bibby highlighted, that is why the SNP gave a clear manifesto commitment to duel the A9 by 2025 and also the A96 between Inverness and Aberdeen by 2030. But those deadlines, indeed those commitments, are no longer clear. The Minister was upset earlier when it was suggested the Greens can veto SNP commitments on roads. But if they can't, maybe the Minister, when summing up, will once and for all tell us will the SNP manifesto commitment to duel the A96 be absolutely delivered? And if so, when will it be delivered? Because the more the government delay, the more casualties there will be on those roads. But dither and delay has been the government's watchwords when it comes to investment on our transport infrastructure. The late STPR2 kicked further into the long grass a whole host of projects crying out for funding. You could almost forgive the wait if it had shed any light on when any of those projects would actually happen, but the vague commitments, the lack of detail, the uncertainty has left communities across Scotland in limbo. A number of members highlighted the fact that just today, Anas Sarwar, Neil Bibham and myself welcomed members of the A77 Action Group, Council Leaders, representatives of ferry firm Stena to Holyrood to brief MSPs on the need to upgrade the A75 and the A77 trunk roads. It is now vital the Scottish Government listen to the clear message we heard and indeed the Minister heard from the community and from the ferry firms. If it is serious about support and not just Wigtonshire's economy, but the whole 
of Scotland's economy. And given that these routes are the gateway to Northern Ireland, then it needs to invest in making those long-forgotten roads fit for purpose. Those communities have waited long enough. And that's why Labour's amendment urges the government to get on with the job, to urgently publish the final STPR2 report with a clear timetable to deliver investment in those strategic active travel, ferry, bus and rail projects, and those improvements we need to Scotland's crumbling roads based on road safety, journey times, economic and community development and climate impact, not based on behind-closed-doors deals which safety on the A96 has been the victim of. No more dithering, no more delay. Now, we all want to see, and in fact we need to see, fewer cars on our roads, but you cannot have an approach to roads that fails to distinguish between urban and rural, that does not understand that in rural communities in particular, a car is often a necessity, not a luxury. So that delivery plan needs to also include a sea change in our woeful record of electrifying car use. The Climate Change Committee estimates that we will need at least 30,000 public EV charging points in Scotland by 2030. The Government's target is just over 4,000 in the next few years. And today, BBC Disclosure revealed damning evidence that almost a quarter of the existing points were faulty. That is not an incentive to switch to electric vehicles, and the Government's record in public transport is certainly not going to get people out of the car onto buses and trains. On this Government's watch, our bus network is being dismantled route by route. Passenger numbers have fallen by 25 per cent since 2007-08. That is 121 million less passenger journeys, yet bus fares rise and rise and rise, nearly 19 per cent in the past five years alone. In 2019, I proposed amendments to the Transport Bill to give councils the power to run their own buses. Three years on, they still have no guidance or funding to establish those bus services to put passengers, not profits, first. More dither, more delay. And the government's record on trains is sadly no better. In 2014, when it handed the keys of Scotland's trains to Dutch firm Abilio, the SNP promised a rail system would be world leading. Well, it certainly did lead the world on fare rises, delays, cancellations. And now the government have cut the number of trains per day by a third. That's 250 per day compared to pre-pandemic levels. And on active travel, the government failed to reach their 2020 target to increase the share of everyday journeys made by bike to 10 per cent. In fact, that year it was just 2 per cent. President officer, transport remains the largest source of climate emissions, nearly 29 per cent, most from cars. That is why Labour's amendment today focuses on reversing this government's woeful record on public transport. But we also recognise that without strategic investment in improving our key trunk roads, whether it is the A96, the A9 in the north, or the A75 and A77 in the south, Scotland's economy and our poor safety record will continue to fail Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Smith. I now call on Patrick Harvey, Minister, to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Government. Up to five minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As many members have done, I'd like to begin by expressing my own sympathies to everyone who's been affected either by the loss of a loved one or indeed by injury on our roads over this year. And as the Minister for Transport has said, the accidents on the trunk roads that members have been discussing in particular today are deeply tragic for everyone. Our road safety framework to 2030 sets out ambitious targets to reduce accidents, and we are absolutely determined to deliver on these. Now, that will address, uh, require us to address the recent upturn in accidents on the A9, while we continue to invest in the safety of our wider network and promote safety for everyone who uses it, the communities it serves, and businesses, services and uh, individuals. This will, of course, require ongoing investment and can support a wide range of outcomes, uh, reducing death and injury on our roads, of course, but also improving safety for communities and reducing the terrible loss uh, that families, friends and individuals suffer whenever a loved one is lost, whether they are a driver, a pedestrian, a cyclist uh, or anyone else. Road safety, every bit as much as the climate emergency, demands of us a change in approach to transport. 
after decades of rising road traffic volumes with all of the additional risk as well as direct environmental damage that results. Now, over the course of today's debate, uh, I'll, uh, I'll give way. Yeah, I'm Brian not going to have time for many, but I'll Brian give way. I'm very grateful for the Minister to giving me. I just wondered whether or not, given the, the issues around rural and urban, whether or not the, the, you're against any kind of road development, especially around developing maybe hydrogen uh, electric superhighways that can connect up our rural and urban economies? Minister. Uh, well, I'm, I'm perhaps on another occasion we'll get into a discussion about the role of hydrogen and, and whether uh, transport is its uh, most, uh, most likely uh, sustainable use. But uh, of course there are differences in terms of urban and rural context, uh, whatever the, the fuel source that's being used. Over the course of today's debate, I've listened carefully to the arguments on progress with dueling works on the A9 between Perth and Inverness and improvements on the A96 corridor. It's important to recognise that the Government is delivering exactly what we said we would do when the shared policy programme was published, as, as committed to in, in just a moment, I'll make some progress, as committed to in that programme, uh, the A9 programme between Perth and Inverness is being taken forward, subject to the, the normal statutory authorisation and business case processes. But road safety, uh, I, I am about to, to turn to, to some of Mr Simpson's comments, so if he, if he lets me make a little progress. Road safety is about more than road design. Uh, increased capacity is certainly no guarantee of better safety. And uh, while I think the Minister was right to say that the Conservative motion that, uh, strikes a respectful tone, I, I genuinely wish that had been true of all the speeches that we've heard some of which appeared more interested in uh, party political point scoring or indeed name calling uh, rather than dealing with the genuinely serious road safety issues. Uh, road safety, uh, Mr Simpson uh, recognised that different uh, reasons exist for all accidents. That's true, but his focus is on one intervention only, duelling. He had little to say, and in fact very few members had very much to say on issues around reducing road speed, reducing traffic volumes, addressing driver behaviour, or indeed uh, the very positive role that cameras can play, as Mr Ruskell mentioned. In what should be a serious debate about road safety, uh, he seemed a little more interested in, in slightly cartoonish imagined conversations between people whose politics he disagrees with. I give way. Uh, uh, Graeme Simpson, briefly, please. Yeah, can I thank the Minister for giving way? He obviously didn't hear my intervention on the Transport Minister, where I welcomed some of the short-term measures that she's going to be carrying out. Uh, the Transport Minister says that she is fully committed to duelling both these roads. Is he? Minister, you have one minute left. Thank you. What I'm fully committed to is what we uh, published in the Butte House Agreement, which is uh, commitment to, to the north uh, and north east, including improvements on the A96 corridor. We have made it very clear that the current plan uh, is to fully duel the A96, but at the same time a transparent, evidence-based review must and will be conducted uh, that includes a climate compatibility assessment uh, to look at the direct and indirect impact on climate and the environment. And I would have hoped that any political party uh, which wills the end by voting for ambitious climate targets, is also prepared to weld the means and will support us taking forward uh, that work. Presiding officer, there isn't enough time to address all of the many issues that I wanted to, to discuss, but I, I genuinely hope that members in discussing these issues will focus on all of the aspects of road safety which need to be taken forward, including the need to reduce traffic speeds, reduce traffic volumes and achieve modal shift onto public and active travel, uh, and also to recognise that many people who are vulnerable uh, to, uh, to uh, issues around road safety need protection when they use active travel as well. There's a huge amount that we need to get right, and the Government is committed to doing that as part of our road safety framework. I support Thank the you. motion in Jenny Gilruth's name. Thank you, Minister. Um, I now call on Liam Kerr to wind up. On behalf of the Scottish Conservatives, up to six minutes, please, Mr Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, perhaps the most telling aspect of this debate happened yesterday evening as it was being set up. You see, the motion in Graham Simpson's name demands Parliament notes with alarm the number of recent fatalities on the A9 and A96 and demands 
a timetable for, for, for the fulfilment of the promise to duel them. But as Graham Simpson pointed out, the amendment in the name of the Minister makes no mention at all of the promises to duel either. Coupled with what we've heard today from the Scottish Government and their Green partners, the people of the North and the North East will no doubt draw the inevitable conclusions. Yet what we've also heard this afternoon from so many speakers is that the accident statistics on the A9 and the A96 are truly horrific. And I particularly note Fergus Ewing's passionate and moving contribution in this regard. Douglas Lumsden told us that since 2019, the A96 has seen 11 fatal accidents, resulting in 13 deaths, whilst 164 people were injured in 94 non-fatal accidents. Between January and August this year, we heard 30 people were injured, nine seriously in crashes on that road, and one person died. In a powerful contribution from Myrtle Fraser, we heard that the a9 has an unenviable reputation as Scotland's most dangerous road. Between 2018 and 21, 21 people have been killed and 257 injured. This year alone, 14 people have lost their lives, the highest number for 12 years. Murdo Fraser told us that 12 of them were on single carriageway will sections. I will. Donald Cameron. Uh, a month ago, a month ago, I attended the funeral of a friend who tragically died in a road accident uh, on the A9 in September. And the sorrow that every fatality brings is simply impossible uh, to describe for the families and close friends uh, of people involved. Does Liam Kerr agree with me that the Scottish Government needs to take swifter action, not just on the A9, but other roads in the Highlands and Islands, like the A83, rest and be thankful, uh, which have not yet seen fatalities but have seen serious accidents and remain perilously dangerous until they are resolved. Liam Carroll? Yes, I do. Absolutely. I, I thank Donald Cameron for the intervention and my condolences to him uh, and indeed all who have lost friends, family and acquaintances for their loss. Every one is a tragedy. And he's right about taking action more widely. I do agree strongly. And indeed, we heard from Finn Carson earlier about the importance of action finally happening on the A77 and 75. And I echo that too. And Craig Hoy made a similar important intervention about the A1 and Sheriff Hall. Presiding officer, in the interest of time, I'll briefly acknowledge the economic aspect of this as well. We heard from Douglas Lumsden how Liz Cameron, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Chamber of Commerce, said that a dual A96 would unlock economic growth, workforce mobility, and investment. And Douglas Ross intervened to talk of Murray Council's survey, saying dueling would benefit business and the economy locally. So, more failures to honour promises are unforgivable. And these are breaches of promises. Because, as we've heard from Graham Simpson, in 2011, the Scottish Government's infrastructure investment plan promised to duel the A96 in full and to duel Perth to Inverness by 2025 in full. Yet only two of 11 sections of the A9 have been done to date. And all we've got on the A96 is a four-week consultation on whether or not to duel it, which has cost nearly £2 million and got fewer, as we heard, than 5,000 responses. What a waste of taxpayers' money. We know what the people want. Yet this survey won't even reveal what the people want, because whilst the Minister claims it is evidence-based, of the 100 questions there is not one which asks about duelling the A96. There are, however, plenty of questions around how old is your vehicle, and what mode of transport do you use, and how good do you feel the active travel options are in your area. It is little wonder, presiding officer, that Stuart Nicholl, chief executive of the Inverness Chamber of Commerce, suggested in July it had been skewed to ensure it gave the result the SNP Green Coalition wanted. And when, as Graham Simpson reminded us, Maggie Chapman said over a year ago that the survey is, and I quote, going to be very clear that actually it isn't viable to duel the whole way, a cynic might suggest that she was simply reflecting what the Scottish Government had already decided to conclude. And given Mr Ewing's comments in summer 2021 that support is forthcoming from all but one party which attracted little support, it is clear that a handful of MSPs who attracted a tiny number of votes 
are capable of holding any manifesto commitment to ransom so long as they're nationalists. Signing officer, it is abundantly clear from this consultation that this SNP government wants to kick this upgrade into the long grass and find any excuse to breach their promise on the A96, just as they've breached it on the A9. Presiding officer, earlier this month, Badenoch and Strathspey councillor Bill Lobbin described the death toll in his ward as catastrophic. He went on, how we tell the people left behind that we could do something about this and we didn't is something we have got to live with. This is more important than money. Indeed so. Presiding officer, more than a decade has gone by since the SNP promised to duel the A96. Promise broken. The A9 was promised to be completed by 2025. Promise broken. It is time for the SNP to stop pandering to their Green partners and get on with these life-saving improvements to duel the A96 and the A9 in full. The family of those killed and injured deserve nothing less. Thank you, Mr Kerr. And that concludes the debate on essential road improvements. And it is now time to move on to the next item of business. Thank you, officer. Sorry, uh, point of order, Mr Jenny Goldruth. Thank you, presiding officer. During the debate, Douglas Ross uh, made mention of a letter I'd received from the Murray Chamber of Commerce on the 21st of September in relation to the A96. I just want to put on record that a response was issued from my parliamentary office on the 18th of October to Sarah Metcalf, who is the Chief Executive of Murray Chamber of Commerce. And I'd be grateful if the official report could be updated accordingly. Uh, could I just perhaps deal with the first point of order, please, Mr Ross? I would just say that isn't really a matter for the Chair, but the, the Minister has made her point and the matter will obviously be reported in the official report. Uh, next point of order, Douglas Ross. Presiding officer, Sarah Medcraft spoke to me earlier this afternoon to say no response had been received from the Scottish Government. So perhaps the Minister could go back to her officials to ensure that it has gone to Murray Chamber of Commerce. Uh, thank you, Mr Ross. Again, that is not a matter for the Chair, but uh, the, the member has made his further uh, request for clarification, and I'm sure the Minister has noted that. And it is now time to move on to the next item of business, which is, thank you members, consideration of business motion 6563 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. I call on George Adam, Minister, to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. I see that no member has asked to speak on the motion, uh, and I therefore uh, Put the question that motion 6563 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of two Parliamentary Bureau motions. I ask George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move motions 6564 on approval of an SSI and 6565 on designation of lead committee. And moved again. Side Thank officer. you, Minister. The question on these motions will be put at decision time. There are seven questions to be put as a result of today's business. I would remind members that if the amendment in the name of Kevin Stewart is agreed to, the amendment in the name of Jackie Bailey will fall by way of preemption. The first question is that amendment 6523.3 in the name of Kevin Stewart, which seeks to amend motion 6523 in the name of Craig Hoy, on National Care Service Viability be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, we are not agreed, and therefore uh, the, there will be a division, a suspension, and uh, I'm trying to find the right page. There will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system. Thank you. That's the right page.